Hey, good evening everyone. Welcome to our daily Dhamma session. I've been inadvertently caught up in a bit of a brouhaha here in Ontario, Canada regarding free speech and gender identity. So I thought I'd look tonight at uh, free speech story is that I, 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 I happen to be at this meeting. I'm on a subcommittee for the this um, committee for building an, building an inclusive community at McMaster University. So and the idea is to combat, for the most part, combat things like racism and religious bigotry and so on. Sexism, you know, homophobia, transphobia, that kind of thing. Because there's unfortunately quite a bit of it going around. There's um, Nazism has come up, and there's, uh, of course, this deep seated hatred of Arab, Arabic people. And there's um, hatred for trans. Tra transsexual people, hatred for homosexual people. There's sexism. Yeah, I got a lot of problems in this world. Master University has its share and and I think it's somewhat unique in its approach or its interest in uh, in coming to terms with those things and trying to do away with them sometimes successful, sometimes perhaps not. But I think it's worthwhile because all these things, of course, talk about defilements. They all come from a corrupt state of mind, bigotry and prejudice are anathema to Buddhism. They're not a part of Buddhism. Buddhism has something to say about these things. Anyway, so I was at this meeting and I got called up. I was just sitting in the back, so there's the main committee meeting and I just showed up because I thought it'd be nice to show my support and ended up getting corralled into being in a picture and ended up making... Anyway, it was a long story. Somehow that picture got caught up in this, this violent debate over free speech and gender identity and I become. I've been identified as a part of the. Uh, I don't know, social justice warrior, or whatever they call us. Movement. It's quite um, unpleasant, I think, to read some of the comments that one sees associated with these things. One of the comments said uh, it uh, identified Buddhism as a devouring mother religion. Which I thought was such a bizarre statement. It was like, I didn't understand if it was even grammatically correct. But it turns out, some of you are probably smarter than me and thus know what this means. It turns out that devouring mother is a, an archetype, I think is the word. Um, that Jung, Carl Jung used, I think. So if you look up Devouring Mother, you can try and figure out how Buddhism could be understood as, uh, as that. I couldn't understand it. And of course, the um, that's incredible, you know. They, people look at this picture and say, all of us are a bunch of freaks and uh, we, typical social justice warrior folk, the dregs of humanity because we don't look like the 
stereotypical male female binary beautiful sexy attractive well dressed contributing member of society you know that kind of thing i mean what's incredible for me is how much corruption of mind there is involved and I, you can't you can't you can't be object you can't be impartial about this there, there's no not taking sides I mean this is wrong it's wrong to you know, there's no question that such bigotry and, and hatred is wrong And so that's what's interesting about this debate for me is the difference between free and right. right? That's what. That's where Buddhism differs from. Perhaps uh, society. And and reasonably so because society is our society here in Canada is pluralistic, and so. We would want no one would want it to be. Well, we, we wouldn't as a community want it to be following one religion because there's a whole bunch of us who wouldn't agree with that. So there's many values that we have to leave unlegislated. But people talk a lot about free, free speech and uh, it goes beyond simply not legislating it. It goes to the point of Believing that if I can say it, I'm, it's right, it's okay to say it. That because I can say it, that's enough to that's enough to think that it's okay to say. Meaning, basically, you say what you want, right? That's what free speech. We have these ideas about freedom. You know this term of the free thinker. Well. Psychopaths are free thinkers. I think Hitler was probably a, to bring up the best example. Hitler was probably a free thinker. I'm not so interested in freedom of this sort in Buddhism. It's a freedom of, uh, of amoral, it's an amoral freedom in the sense that there is no right and wrong. It's the free speech is the right to shout theater in a crowd, uh, fire in a crowded theater. Theater in a crowded fire is another way it's supposed to put. It means you can say what you want, but that's not free speech. That's not, that's not how free speech should be understood because it's wrong speech. You yell fire in a crowded theater, that's very wrong. Are you free to say it? I mean, no one can really stop you. They can punish you for it, but it's not easy to stop someone. So in a sense, we're all free to say such things. I mean, it's important to distinguish this as meditators because it gives us a sense of what we're trying to do here. We're trying to understand what is right free will. We're not so interested in understanding free will or answering this question of free will. We're very much interested in right will, right intention, right? Do we have free will? Who cares? Do we have right will? That's the question. We're not so interested in our, our own ideas, because in the end it's not even freedom, right? We say, I want free speech, but what you really mean to mean is I want to be a slave to my, my, my personality, and that's what it is. You know, you're not free, you're completely contrived, and so you see people who grew up in conservative areas spouting nonsense about homosexual people and women and blacks and Mexicans and 
Muslims, Arabs. I'm not so keen on Islam myself, so I want to distinguish that. But talking about uh, people, you know, that's not free speech. There's nothing free about that. You're totally trapped. You're, you're trapped in this vicious, pernicious, corrupt mind. I've met people like this. It's quite scary that such people exist. And so this is a crucial aspect of our meditation that we not be we not be attached to our personality. And we see that we come to see that much of what we think of as free will, free thought, free speech comes from comes from our personality. It's dependent on uh, the artifices that we build up, the patterns of behavior that we carry with us. We're not free in any sense of the word. The only way you could truly be free is if you were free from the corruption, if you had right speech, because then you would be free not to, but you would be free from, free from suffering free from evil, free from blame, free from justified blame anyway. They're all always going to blame you for something. So society has a, has a problem with trying to legislate right, what is right and what is wrong. And so there is, free speech is, is allowed it's an important aspect of a pluralistic society. We want to be allowed to dissent. We want to be allowed to have independent opinions. So the recognition that many pe different people have different views. To allow this exchange of views, this exchange of ideas. So this question came up of uh, where, sh how should society legislate? How far should society go to legislate speech? But there is a line. I mean, there's a clear line. I can, I can attack your religion. I should be able to say I don't really like Islam. I should be able to say Islam is not a very good religion in my, in my view some good things. I mean, that would be overly general, but, but Islam has some, some problems. I should be able to say that. I mean, I, I, to be clear, I, say this, I would say the same thing about Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, yeah. But the worst, the worst ones are, well, Judaism and Islam, I think, are probably the worst. They just have such horrible things in them. Yeah, some good. There are. You can find gems of goodness, as you can find. Nothing is cut and dried like that. But you should be able to say that is my point. But I shouldn't be able to say that Arab people are dirty or Arab people are evil or Arab people are thieves, crooks. Uh, you know, you shouldn't be able to say that, right? That's called hate speech. It's not hate speech, in my mind anyway, and I hope it never come becomes thought of as hate speech, to say that Islam is, you know, this view in Islam is bad. In Judaism, when they say you should throw stones at people, you should stone people to death, that's bad. That's wrong. But Jewish people are shysters, are, are crooks, are... You know, shouldn't be able to say that. That's hate speech. That's what we look at in Buddhism. We look at, I mean, it's very, it, it, it dovetails quite nicely with the line that we draw in society, in Buddhism. You know, 
one one of the I'm always I always admire to some extent anyway uh, the law judges if you ever read the opinions of judges on on cases they're thoughtful people and they tend to be in in many ways aligned with Buddhism like studying religion how religion has been applied in many ways it's quite Buddhist you know it, it analyzes religion in terms of what's actually going on do people actually hold these views and so on so in this case it dovetails nicely with the fact that we're talking about ethics you know you have the right to say all sorts of crazy things but if it if it's hurtful if it's hateful if it's uh, disregarding if it's if it's negligent speech purposefully disregarding someone's um, worth as a person all of these things we would consider to be potential objects of legislation because they are potentially wrong and not only wrong but they are egregiously wrong we would say and that's interesting in, from a Buddhist point of view as well because you know, meditation, or, or in a meditation center, there are many things that can go wrong. Um, you know, we talk about, you know, in, in Christianity they say, do you want to Jesus say that, uh, to, committing adultery, he said, if you, if, you, if you think about your neighbor's wife or something like that, you've already committed adultery or something like that. So I'm not going to go around about, it's not, this isn't meant to be about bashing Christianity or Islam or other religions, but we make this distinction in, in, in Buddhism as well between um, evil and, and egregiously evil. I made a comment that was perhaps problematic on Stack Exchange where I said all sexual activity is immoral. And I've been thinking about that, or I was thinking about that, and I mean, they're just words, but you do want to be clear that I'm not saying you're an evil person because you have sex, but sexuality is involved with lobha, which is an unwholesome mind state. It's an evil mind state. Um, but it's perhaps wrong because you, you want to be clear that you're not... There, there's different levels to this. So we wouldn't legislate people yelling at each other, for example. If I yell at you and say, I hate you, you're worthless, you're stupid, eh, we don't want to legislate that. But when you attack a person's very being, or when your speech is harmful to one's very being, that's where we want to say it's egregious. And so in Buddhism, it's interesting, in Buddhism this sort of hate speech is actually legislated. You can't, even jokingly, um, there was this horrible situation. Thailand can be really, I don't know, traditional societies sometimes get caught up in incredible prejudices, just due to geographic isolation mostly. And remember when I first went to Thailand, um, I was sitting with this Thai monk and we were watching this, uh, this dark-skinned tourist walk by and he, he turns to him and he says, oh, dirty. And now that's hate speech, or that's, you know, that, not my hate speech exactly, but that's, that's terrible racism, bigotry, whatever you want to call it. That's just awful. But um, then I li was listening to some monks many years later joke about this. There was this uh, dark-skinned man going to stay up on a mountain, monk, going to stay up. And he wasn't even, he was Thai, but he was from the south, so he had dark skin. And uh, he was going to stay up on the mountain. And one of the very white-skinned Bangkok monks, rich kid, said, said to him, I mean, they were good friends, but he says to him, he says, Oh, we, we'll come back and the clouds will be all black. 
that's actually wrong. That's that's uh, breaking a rule in Buddhism, even as just as a joke. If you joke about someone's, like if you make a joke about women, if I say something like, just as a joke, I say, uh, women should be barefoot and pregnant or something like that, even as a joke, breaking a rule. So there's this question now of whether um, whether people who don't identify, well first the question of if I was born a man and I transitioned to become a woman and then someone still refers to me as a man, disregarding the fact that I want to be referred to as a woman, is that hate speech? There's a big, this is a huge, violent debate. This is the debate that I got caught up in. And, and more than that, what if someone doesn't identify as either male or female and they want to be called they or them? They don't want you to refer to them as him or her, he or she. And so there's this one professor that has refused, refused to use third person pronouns or refused to use pronouns in general and says he's going to call people male or female. I think that's what his argument is, or what his stance is. Anyway, I don't want to get too much into that, but looking at the, just getting back to the ideas that we're interested in, the results, and this is an important thing to think about as well, is the results of his obstinance and his um, insistence that this is a violation of free speech. I mean, the results of that have not been pleasant. It has fed a great amount, a huge amount of hatred and bigotry and uh, corruption of mind. You know, people who had these thoughts, people who whose ignorance, and and it is ignorance. I mean. Not to say that he's ignorant or that everyone is ignorant, but there is ignorance. People don't understand and they've never really thought about what is it like to be someone who d doesn't identify as male or female? What is it like to be feel like a man trapped in a woman's body? I mean, most of us can't understand it, you know, can't sim empathize. We don't know what it's like, but we can sympathize and we can try to understand. Many people don't even try to understand or, or accept the fact that it might be very difficult. Accept that this person doesn't see themselves the way we see them, or the way we would expect them to see themselves. And so to me there's an issue there. You know, this, is, this is something where I would want to have compassion for this person. And I would want to be um, erring on the side of, of compassion. Could people take advantage of it? Apparently, yes. Apparently, there are people who want to be called pixie kin and dragon kin or worm kin or something that, who they identify with. And I, I can't help but think that a lot of that's just frivolous and, and silly, but um, nonetheless, and it, it doesn't infringe upon my rights in any meaningful way to have to call someone pixie kin. If someone wants to be called a pixie, I'm, hey, I, I want people to call me a bhikkhu. I mean, there's two sides. I get to another side of it, but this is the first side. Is that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's it's dangerous for us to say that. We should be allowed to disregard people's identity. We should be allowed to delegitimize who they are, on the one hand. Why? Because the results. The results are a huge, a, a huge disparity, you know, an irregularity, I don't know what you call it, a statistical significant 
disparity between suicide rates, where you have trans people committing suicide in great numbers, homosexual people as well. But no, I'm dealing specifically talking about trans people here. It's just off the charts. It's very high. And besides suicide, you have murder, right? The result is, is such vehement hatred when you, when you do this, when you, when you fail to sympathize, when you fail to see the social importance of of uh, making an allowance for these people. I mean, it's, it's the difference between equity and equality, they say. Equality means there's the door, we walk through it. Equity means, well, if you're in a wheelchair, we'll make a ramp for you. Certain people have spe special needs. It's not whether I think they have the needs, it's whether... I mean, I guess it's to some extent whether they think they do. Uh, you know, worrying about abuse is another thing, but no, I guess it's whether society thinks they do and whether they legitimately do. But my point, I mean, this is what I've gotten caught up in. I'm not really caught up in it. It's just funny, kind of, that I've been called out on the internet and Buddhism has been called these bad names and so on by people who, whose opinions don't really matter to me. Um, though, you know, criticism is always to be taken and considered. Um, but the point is the, the, the corruption, the, the evil involved. There's no other way of putting it. This is a great evil. But there's another side to this. And the other side is the social justice warrior. Personally, I, I like this term. I think it's good to fight for social justice. I think it's a good thing. But it, but it, becomes, it becomes mean and nasty. So there was a huge protest when this professor tried to come and talk, and they wouldn't even let him talk, which I don't think he has anything. I mean, personally, I'm not that impressed by what he has to say, but the fact that they were so angry at him, I don't see that as being a good thing either. You see? If anything out of this, as meditators, as Buddhists, what we can get is how, how fairly simple it is to figure out all these complex societal issues. Untangling the tangle, right? What I was talking about last night. That's the sort of thing I was thinking about. It's not that difficult. If we could be sensitive and compassionate to others, and if we could be pure in our hearts, so the internal and the external. Externally, we, we, we're conscious, we're mindful of the impacts that our acts and our words and our thoughts have on others. And we try to act accordingly, not, not with free thought, free speech, free action. That's rubbish. But with right thought, right speech, right action. And it doesn't have to be strict in line with this religious principle or that religious principle, but if we recognize that something is just a bad thing to do or say, that it's causing harm and it's either outright evil or it's dismissive, then we should avoid that and society should have something to say about that, I think. And uh, so externally and internally, we look at our minds, working out why am I doing things. There's so much you can learn and, and all these stances that we take. I'm right, you know, thinking I'm right. <laughs> they all fall apart. You become quite humble, quite ashamed in many ways of who you are, realizing how arrogant and pretentious we can be, how set we can become in our views and opinions, how caught up by them we become. It's very hard to change your view once you've committed to it, right? 
And that's the wonder of meditation, is that you don't have to believe me, you don't have to agree with me. When you look inside, you'll see right and wrong. And I mean, it's perhaps one thing that is not well enough admitted or, or acknowledged by society, by the world, is that there is right and wrong beyond subjective ideas of it. That there is only one right and wrong. It's just a question of how you find it. Many people would say it's impossible to know right and wrong. It's actually quite easy, right? This leads to suffering, okay, I'll stop that, that's wrong. This leads to happiness, to peace, mm, that's right. Everything becomes so simple. You can see through any complex problem, because you see what's going on in people's minds. I can have the greatest argument for why you should agree with me, and I can still be very wrong. You cut through it and you see this person's just full of themselves, arrogant, puffed up. And cut through it. Cut through the delusion with a knife. The knife we use is objectivity based on the four foundations of mindfulness, or mindfulness, let's say. When we observe things and we remind ourselves this is this, that is that, anger is anger, speech is speech, it's not free, it just is, it's not right, it just is. When we start to see what's really right and wrong is our own defilement, our own intentions. We start to see those qualities of mind that are wrong. And they're wrong in a very simple sense. They're wrong because um, they're the wrong, they don't lead to the desired result. They don't fulfill our expectations. Greed doesn't fulfill our expectation for happiness. Anger doesn't f fulfill our expectation for freedom from suffering. Delusion doesn't fulfill our expectation of self of identity because as we know reality is impermanent suffering and non-self that's what we're looking at so I think it's a really good example of how Meditation goes all the way from the microcosm to the macrocosm, how society can be understood as a meditator. It's also a good way of tackling this debate about free will or free speech, free thinkers, <laughs> free thought. On the one hand, we want to give this to society. Society wants to be pluralistic. It's important, as we acknowledge that not everyone is Buddhist, unfortunately. But on the other hand, as Buddhists we want to speak up and say hatred is, hatred is not allowed, bigotry is not allowed, we will not tolerate it. What does that mean, not tolerate it? I don't know. I guess we'll, we will kind of tolerate it, but we'll put our foot down and say that this, is, this goes against the principles of a just and fair society. These goes that go against goodness. So we wouldn't throw people in jail over it, but we would take a stand and say that's wrong. Anyway, so there's the a dhamma for tonight. Hopefully it wasn't too worldly for y'all. Thank you all for tuning in. Have a good night.